This news program is proudly brought to you by Smart Start Breakfast Biscuits and M Now Biscuits. PM leaves for Australia today. Dr. Puka says Australia is insensitive to the vote of no confidence. And rising law and order issues affect businesses. A very good evening. This is National MTV News. I'm Tamara Agavi. Thank you for joining us. Prime Minister James Marape departed the country this morning to Australia to address the Australian Parliament and will return on Friday this week. The Prime Minister said this dialogue with the Australian Prime Minister and other ministers will be on trade, commerce and people-to-people -people relationship. Before departing for Australia this morning, the Prime Minister said his address to the Parliament at 10 a.m. tomorrow is more about thanking Australia. We're, we're just moving away from the aid and rent conversations. And so there is, there is no uh, uh, greater moment than this for me to go down to Australia and thank them. Uh, we were bettered from the hands of Australia as a nation. After addressing the parliament, he will be addressing the Australian National University and he said these were dates set months in advance. Marape said Australia and PNG have a strong bond and Australia remains our biggest trading partner. Uh, you know, it's not always about asking. As I said, the point of reference with me and uh, the, the uh, Prime Minister Albanese and uh, the ministers in our ministerial dialogue would be about trade, commerce, people-to-people -people relationship. He calls for the public to speak with respect for the country as he is representing the country. I want to encourage everyone, whether they are elected uh, leaders into office or every citizen who are offering commentaries out there. You have your right to offer commentary, but speak and utter with responsibility. It is your country's image. Uh, you're not affecting James Marape, you're affecting the country. Two senior countrymen also accompanied Marape to Australia. I want to uh, advise Papua New Guineans, don't take your sovereignty for granted. I'm taking with me two of, two, uh, uh, of the fathers of our country representing the class of Papua New Guineans who bettered this country. Sir Rabukumara uh, from the Western Highlands representing the provincial government leaderships in the 1970s and Sir Yano Bello representing the ministers. Uh, who were in minister from the transitional self-government, uh, pre-independence government. In his absence, Deputy Prime Minister John Rosso will be the acting Prime Minister till he returns. Estagane, National MTV News. Commenting on the visit to Australia by Prime Minister James Marape, Sepuka Temu, member for About Open, stress that Papua New Guinea and Australia enjoy the closest of relationships, making it all the more astonishing that Australia's Prime Minister would invite James Marape to a state visit just days before a vote of no confidence becomes allowable. With much anticipation on the forthcoming event that will set history for both Australia and PNG when Marape addresses the Australian Parliament on the 8th of this month, concerns have been raised by one of the country's senior political figure and current member for about district, Sir Pukatemu. 8th of February for our Prime Minister to address the people of Australia through their house. Then I'm saying, hold on. You need to be a bit more sensitive. You need to not interfere with our domestic politics. He further added that there are many unlawful activities going on within the country that compromises the nation's democracy and underscores that Australia is renowned for its stance when it comes to democracy. 
However, he further added that the political process of PNG matter and need to be respected and not interfered in the way Australia is currently doing. He also urged Australia to leave our politics alone and focus on their own domestic matters and to provide the sort of good guidance that the Marape-led government needs to sort out serious allegations of widespread corruption. And I'm urging Australia in the in the packages of development partnership that we have agreed to between Australia and Papua New Guinea, whether it's the economic package or our know, social areas like health and education or law and order, we must strengthen processes of institutions of state. We must make sure that good management and good administration, transparency and accountability is maintained. Dr. Temu mentioned that the solution is to invite the Prime Minister or his successor once the vote of no confidence process have concluded. It's better for Australia to have waited for the vote of no confidence to finish, which is our political process, allowed by the constitution of our country. And then if he wanted, then obviously he would have gone and spoken to them when he's already won the vote of no confidence. Prime Minister James Marape departed the country earlier today. He will be given full state visit, honours with a 19-gun salute, reception at the government house and addresses the Parliament House of Australia tomorrow, which is one day to the due date of the vote of no confidence, which is on the 9th of this month. Sharon Engnui, National MTV News. The Sumari Institute of Leadership and Governance today swore in five of its board members before Magistrate Peter Balos at the, at the Department of Personal Management Office in Port Mosby. A small yet significant historic event for the country's leadership and governance institution saw Magistrate Peter Balos officiated the formalities. Chairing the ceremony, DPM Secretary and CILAG Chair Lady, Taya Sensen, shared a brief. You all know uh, there were amendments under the, the Pacific Institute of Leadership and Governance uh, Act uh, 2017, passed by Parliament uh, last year, that led to the, to the changes uh, in the membership of the board. Um, so some few uh, uh, changes were made especially to the um, the chairperson of the board, which the secretary for DPM will now hold that uh, um, chair, plus the other members uh, who have been there in the previous um, the, the, the board and the council set up. So that's the reason why we are here this morning for this uh, uh, official uh, swearing in. These new board members were Paul Niaga from the Department of Finance, Philip Leo from the Department of Provincial and Local Level Government Affairs, representing the Department of Higher Education, Research, Science and Technology, Ruth Philip, DPM Secretary Taya Sensen as the CILAG Chair Lady with CILAG CEO Michael Barobe as the fifth board member. CILAG CEO Michael Barobe elaborated on why this swearing-in had to occur soon. For the meantime, uh, this uh, by law act of uh, CILAG but that requires this department heads who are here today to be sure in as a board member. And uh, that's the why we have got the programs coming up and uh, we cannot delay, so that's why we are here to swear that, I mean, the swear this members in and the normal operation and the continuity of the institute must continue. The swearing in ceremony ended on a high note with sense and challenging public servants to continue to perform in the public sector. Claire Mauta, National MTV News. Following the swearing-in of the new board members today, SILAG's CEO Michael Barobe made mention that the institute will be changed to a university by 2027. I just want to uh, just uh, add on um, to what the CEO um, has said. I think yeah, what, what we're looking at uh, going into the future is um, transforming the current institution into a university status um, and that university will be responsible for you know training for all public servants 
those those people coming out from universities and before they become they, before they enter the workforce, they, they will have to go through this um, university to learn the ropes of public service, you know, from bottom up before they come into the workforce. So we've got this challenge before us, and I'm pleased that we have these uh, board members, uh, ex officio members, uh, in place. And the swearing in will take place, so we'll have this full board in place, so we can run our, you know, affairs of the the board and the institution. The rising law and order issues and service disruptions has muted business confidence. This is according to BSP Financial Group's quarter four of 2023 Pacific Economic and Market Insight report. The bank's general manager for corporate banking, Peter Beswick, stated that the sequenced depreciation of the PNG Kina to U.S. dollars mid-rate beginning in May added to the unease in the business community, with the questions being raised on whether the timing was right for the PNG Kina to U.S. dollar depreciation in 2023. Whilst commenting on business sentiments in 2024, Mr. Beswick states that the events that transpired on the 10th of January this year severely impacted business sentiment and serve as a reminder of the rising law and order issues PNG face as the lack of employment opportunities, continued urban migration and rising cost of living that create a focal point for unrest. He further outlined that there are emerging concerns of political uncertainty as the vote of no confidence becomes permissible in February and remarked that whatever the outcome, government must work towards repairing business confidence and deliver on the announced Black Wednesday. Mr. Baswick concludes that the signing of the Papua LNG FID will be important in boosting business morale and be the trigger point for an extended investment supercycle for PNG. Sharon Engnui, National MTV News. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. You're watching National MTV News. The PNG Cocoa Board has advised that the hike in the price of cocoa dry bean is projected to remain at 1,000 kina per bag of 62.5 kilograms for the next six months. Cocoa farmers and dry bean producers in cocoa growing provinces would now have the opportunity to bring thousands of kina home amidst the low yielding period in other cocoa supplying countries in the world. The regional coordinator for cocoa in Sipic region, Mr. Daryl Warimo, made this remark whilst responding to this newsroom. One thing that we want from you is uh, your quality is of paramount importance. Farmers has to maintain it and bring it. If you want the price to stay as the steady, steady as it is, maintain, maintain good quality and bring it. Mr. Warimo stressed that the market demand for PNG cocoa product is high at the moment. It now relies on each individual farmer to do the right thing so that the country maintains its status of supplying quality cocoa bean. The WeWork branch manager for Eleven, the leading dry bean buying depot in the country. In terms of buying price, Joe and Barry shared similar sentiments and remind all farmers not to be overwhelmed by the price and skip a process. Farmers are to complete all the required period for fermenting and drying before selling. Meanwhile, farmers doing sales in the last few working days in Wiwek have expressed satisfaction and pledged to offer their support to the market by producing quality beans. Natasha Ovoy, National, MTV News. Total Energies launched its mobility fleet card yesterday evening in Port Mosby. These mobility cards will not only allow its users to purchase fuel, but also goods from Total Energy service station shops. 
The managing director of Total Energy's Marketing and Services, Damien Rocks, highlighted that this occasion is as important as opening a new fuel service station. Total Energies operate in more than 65 countries all around the world, and Papua New Guinea is one country that has service stations without fleet cards. The Mobility Fleet Card is a tool that will allow Total Energies customers to control fuel consumption in real life and save money. Now, this is not only a fuel card, but this is really a mobility service. So first of all, it will help the customers to prevent fraud, if they don't want to uh, have their cards working on Sunday, on Saturday, or whatever days, this will be possible. They will be uh, uh, also able to post-pay or to prepay, depending on uh, their, their choice. And most of all, they will monitor their fuel consumption in order to make savings at the end of the month. This will also allow them to buy, if they want, obviously, goods in the service station. So as you understand, it's not only a fuel car, as many already exist on the market, but it's a real complete solution as a mobility service. The fleet card also allows users to track the consumption of fuel on their smartphones and laptops. At the end of the month, you press the button and you have exactly what is uh, the, the amount of, uh, without GST, the amount of GST and it will make your life much easier. Again, it's very important to monitor your consumption. As I said, what can be measured can be controlled. The fuel card will help our customers to make sure that they, can, they have a full control about their fuel consumption. And we all know that fuel is a heavy burden in the budget of an individual or of a company. The Brian Bell Group of companies has trialed the fleet cut at the Barocco Total Energies fuel station from September of 2023 to date. Ian Clough, the chairman of Brian Bell, confirmed that the trial use of cut was a complete success in three key areas, which is the control of fuel usage, managing of fuel expenses, and managing of spin controls. Malinta Yopolo, National MTV News. Law and order starts at home from the family level to the ward level and to the provincial level and then to the country. This was emphasized by Chief Executive Officer for Mount Hagen City, Leonoki. When it comes to awareness on law and order, everyone has a part to play. This was expressed during the presentation of the police vehicles to police in Hagen by the Mount Hagen City Authority recently. Administrator for Western Highlands Province Joseph Mangbill said Western Highlands should lead by example as the leading province for the Highlands region. Three times population increasing and with the law and order, a big law problem. But Western Highlands will be changed. Anger will change, LA will change, Tuala will change, Southern Islands will change because Western Islands and Mama provinces, Sydney province or Islands region. So let's change our mindset at all levels. Mangbil further elaborated that real change must come from within. Sharing similar sentiments, CEO for Mount Hagen City, Leo Noki, said all must be responsible to raise awareness on law and order, especially to ensure safety for the women folk. Uh, you must run free, or marry Pignini, or line or come, all can walk in shopping, all can walk in business. Provincial Police Commander John Sagum warned against ethnic clashes and urged the people from other provinces coming into Mount Hagen to take responsibility on maintaining order in the city. Ethnic clash, that is the Simbu fight, Simbu the Borgo fight, that is the Wabek fight. This is you must stop him now. You come right here, take responsible, no place where you stop him. Natasha Voy National, MTV News. The people of Mirigini in Hanwabada village turned up in numbers today to witness the groundbreaking ceremony of the Mirigini water, water Farm Project. This is the first pilot project rolled out in the nation's capital and funded by Water PNG. 
The groundbreaking ceremony was done in the presence of Water A General Manager for Government and Community Relations, Hong Kiap, and Community Councillor Nao Oala. Oala highlighted the Mirigini community has been struggling for the last 20 years with water. Me and my team achieved a success in providing assistance in Mirigini. One of my platforms in my electric in accessing basic services such as water and power. The Mirigini Water Farm Project is a funded initiative from Water PNG. The general manager, government and community relations for Water PNG, Hong Kiap, stated that the purpose of this project is to improve water supply into communities, such as villages and settlements, to enable them to have access to constant water supply. Kiap further elaborates on this project. Today, Mirigini is fortunate to have this a special project. Water PNG has now taken the approach to give water to the village and settlement areas and, and maybe with the aim of removing this control system so that the village and settlements including uh, Mirigini now can have constant water flow. We have initiated a program called, uh, called Meetup Farming as opposed to the previous arrangement where individuals tap into the main line and are meted separately. But this one, all the meters will be caged in one location. So whoever wants a meter will come and connect to the meter. So the line about 30 meters going from the meter to your property, you have the responsibility to look after it so that no one taps illegally onto your line. In that way, you get the honest supply of water and you pay for honest service that you get. The Mirigini community were challenged by Kiap to take ownership of this basic service once it is completed. He said bringing such services involves procedures, hence taking ownership will allow this service last longer. Kiap also congratulated Oala for constantly following up to see this project come into fruition. Gladys Kila, National MTV News. This year marks International Training Institute's 10 years of being accredited by the Department of Higher Education, Science and Technology. This year is also the 25th year of service as an educational institution. The International Training Institute established in 1999 and accredited in 2014 by the Department of Higher Education, Research, Science and Technology has just did their orientation program today. The school is expecting five to 700 students to register for this academic year. Managing Director of ITI, Kumran Sentival, says they are working on the institution's facilities, both physical and internal. As we grow and we become into more higher education programs, so we have to reduce that intake as well. Uh, so basically, we have uh, two intakes per year. Uh, so it's in February and then in July, June, July period. So all campuses are the same now. Um, so our through our audits, um, we set up a lot of internal processes. I mean, there's two sides of the audit. One is your physical facilities. One is your internal process. Internal process is much more in terms of what you need to do as well. So in terms of physical facilities, we have, uh, for each campus, we have created a computer lab, we have created a lecture theaters, we have upgraded our lecturers. This was revealed via a Skype interview today. He says this year they have seven new programs that will be introduced. We have five higher education programs accredited under the new system. And we have just uh, uh, got an approval, well, we got a letter last week. Uh, we submitted two other programs as well. That is for uh, small business, uh, higher diploma in small business and entrepreneurship, and higher diploma in tourism. Both were approved as well. So that is accurate. So we actually have uh, seven new programs under the new system. 
He further stated that ITI offers 350,000 Kina scholarships each year to 70 to 80 students across its campuses who meet the requirements. To date, the institution has graduated over 20,000 students with diploma and certificate in various courses. James Guken, National MTV News. And now to the Nesfan market report. The Kina closed unchanged at 0 0.2669 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0 0.2594 US dollars, 0 0.3949 Australian dollars, 0 0.233 Euro, and 38.03 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, Gold is trading higher, coffee closed lower, cocoa closed higher, copra closed higher, palm oil closed lower, crude oil is trading lower, copper closed higher. On the stock market, the Dow Jones closed higher, the ASX 200 is trading higher, and the All Ordinaries is trading higher. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. You're watching National MTV News. Moving on to overseas news, Fiji's former Prime Minister Frank Baini Marama has been granted bail by a Fiji court and released from custody after facing a charge of abuse of office. The former leader was charged by Fiji police last night over what it described as a reckless abuse of his position over a tender process dating back 12 years. Mr. Banimarama, who led Fiji for 16 years before being ousted in the 2022 election, spent the night behind bars along with his former Attorney General and right-hand man, Ayaz Syed Karkum. Both men were granted bail. The former Prime Minister didn't speak outside court. Mr. Syed Kayim told local media they were fight the charges. New Zealand's government has urged pro-independence rebels in Indonesia's Papuan region to release a pilot 12 months on since he was taken hostage. Philip Mertens is a charter plane pilot who flew his aircraft into a remote airstrip in the Papuan Highlands only for his plane to be ambushed by a group of armed men. Twelve months later, he is still being held by those pro-independence rebels in the jungles of Papua. The last images we saw of him were released around Christmas time. On the 12-month anniversary, New Zealand's Foreign Minister Winston Peters has reiterated that Mr Mertens must be immediately released, saying his continued detention serves the interests of no one. He says around Christmas time, Mr Mertens was able to speak with some family members to assure them that he is alive and well and that the New Zealand government has been working with various Indonesian agencies to try and secure his release. But over the past year, there hasn't been much progress. Indonesia's military has had several clashes with pro-independence rebels while looking for Philip Mertens. There have been deaths on both sides. And police in Papua have been working with church groups to try to peacefully persuade the rebels to release the hostage. The main problem, it appears, is that the rebels themselves are divided. The faction holding Philip Mertens reiterated that it wants to release him in exchange for independence being granted in Papua. But a spokesman for the broader pro-independence movement rebuked that, saying Mr Mertens should be immediately released because there's no precedent anywhere in the world of independence being granted in exchange for hostages. Philip Mertens has a wife and a young child here in Indonesia. On the 12-month anniversary of his capture, the New Zealand government has appealed for their privacy to be respected. King Charles has been seen in public for the first time since his short cancer diagnosis. The news triggered a flood of well wishes, as well as a reunion with his son, Prince Harry.
The king spotted for the first time since announcing his cancer battle, and he was all smiles. The 75-year-old and his wife waved to onlookers outside Buckingham Palace. All eyes were on the royal reunion. Prince Harry landed in London after learning of his dad's diagnosis, the Duke of Sussex arriving at his father's residence alone and leaving less than an hour later. It's the first time the pair is believed to have met since the coronation in May, but it's understood he has no plans to see his brother, Prince William. This whole family feud seems a bit silly in my opinion, as you'll make up, and hopefully this brings them together a little bit more. Many families have grim diagnoses of horrible diseases, and, and, and what tends to happen is that, you know, you park the minor grievances and get on with the big stuff. So I think he'd be delighted that he's got both of his sons back on home soil. Other royals were stepping up. Your Royal Highness, how is the King? Princess Anne attending multiple public events in England. While well wishes poured in from around the world, the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak reassured the public he's in regular contact with the King and revealed he caught his cancer in the early stages. I think that gives great hope and encouragement to other people who are facing a cancer diagnosis, encouraging people to go to their GP to get checked out. There's been no further updates from the palace on the King's health and it's expected that from this point forward many details of his treatment and recovery will be kept private. Charles and Camilla left London for their Sandringham estate in the countryside where the king can get peace and privacy between treatments. 38 people are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in Australia every day. Despite this, a researcher from the University of South Australia says the condition is still under-recognised and under-treated. Parkinson's is the second most common neurological disease in Australia. It causes motor symptoms like slowness of movement and also tremors, but also causes non-motor symptoms like gastrointestinal issues and also fatigue. There is about 100,000 people in Australia that are living with Parkinson's and up to 85% of those will experience some sort of pain. And it is pain that has been under-recognised and under-treated. Researchers now know that better care is needed for those with Parkinson's, uh, now they uh, will start to investigate the characteristics and the treatment of pain in the hope to better improve pain care uh, for those uh, who have Parkinson's. Anthony Mazzini, who was the uh, principal investigator, he said that it is commonly known that Parkinson's uh, affects people's ability for uh, body movement, but uh, he said that pain is the leading contributor for a reduced quality of life uh, with those, uh, for those living with Parkinson's. Uh, the prevalence of Parkinson's has nearly doubled in the past 25 years. Uh, worldwide, there is about eight and a half million people living with the disease. National MTV News continues after the break with True Kai Sports. Stay with us. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. The preparation for the upcoming PNG Games in Southern Highlands Province is currently underway. This was revealed by the Chief Executive Officer of the PNG Sports Foundation, Albert Veratau, in an interview with this newsroom yesterday in Port Mosby. CEO Veratau mentioned that all the preparatory work and technical evaluations has been completed. The Prime Minister made the announcement. It was like uh, almost like a uh, fitting, um, fitting story for us because we wanted, we wanted to have the games, but we couldn't uh, have it because of uh, due to funding. So when the, uh, when the Prime Minister and the government committed that they will do it, uh, host the games in Mendy, the council, PNG Games Council again, resolved to endorse that, uh, that request to have the games move back to uh, Mendy. So the games will now be played in Mendy, 
in um, September, from the September 15th to September 27th uh, this year. He added that they will seek funding for the games from the government next week. So that all, all parties has been uh, identified, budgets are now being put together. So uh, we will now request the government uh, next week to put uh, some money down so that we can start the, commence the work on building the, uh, you know, completing the infrastructures, commence the work for preparing the place, making sure all the, uh, the post-organizing committee is uh, well resourced to. Verata also revealed that the council had initially agreed to host the games in Port Mosby. However, two weeks before the event was scheduled to take place, only two provinces managed to secure funding for the logistics, leading to a deferment of the games to September in Southern Highlands. James Cooken, Trukai Sports. The PNG Boxing Union is preparing to work with the PNG Sports Foundation on the Go Rural to Go Global program. This was revealed yesterday by the PNG Boxing Union President Dr. Gideon Kendino. Dr. Kendino said this is to make sure to strengthen clubs and associations. But we've gone ahead now and um, created an office space that we're going to be renting, and then having two staff that we would like to be administrators that will then be looking at working with the foundation on their programs so that wherever they want to start the Go Rural Go Global program with, with, with another sport like soccer or uh, netball or any, any other sport, uh, boxing tags along with them and then we can and then run club administration and um, association administration courses. He added that they are looking forward to producing more qualified and fit boxers to participate in the upcoming PNG Games. James Gooken, Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports continues after the break. Stay with us. Trukai Sports. You're watching Trukai Sports. South Star Sports Development Association in the Southern Highlands Province will be facilitating a UNDP-funded program called Enhancing Peace and Social Cohesion, commencing on the 12th of this month to June this year. South Star Sports Development Association or SSDA Director Timothy Marco said the aim of the program is to empower youths and engage their involvement in basketball competitions. He said this will help youths overcome negative influences affecting peace in the province. Marco said that sports is a positive and a proven medium to bring peace, suppress gender-based violence and reduce the use of illicit drugs. After hosting the first successful peace basketball tournament last year in Mendy Town, SSDA plans to continue the initiative this year. He urged local leaders, businesses and stakeholders to support the Peace Guides initiative and network establishment to mobilize, educate and empower community volunteers. Natasha Voy, Chukai Sports. Meanwhile, South Star Development Association Director Timothy Mako said the association will run basketball coaching level one and FIBA referee rules alongside the peace program. Mako said the goal of the coaching program is to ensure youths in the rural areas gain update on basketball coaching, FIBA rules and elite skills training in line with the PNG Basketball Federation standards. SSDA has been working in the province since 2012, initiating sports training despite many challenges faced and will continue to provide sports training programs for the unfortunate youths, giving equal opportunities for both genders on becoming role models for communities in the future. He also thanked UNDP for recognizing and supporting the organization's long-term goal and vision in providing training programs for unfortunate young people. Natasha Voichukai Sports. 
Dead and Struka Sports, the Money Plus weather report is next. Stay with us. Kai Sports. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. The weather forecast for the next 24 hours. Southern region, Port Mosby City, partly cloudy with chances of few showers and drizzles. Daru, partly cloudy with brief showers. Kerema, partly cloudy with showers. Alotau, partly cloudy with few possible showers. Popandeta, partly cloudy with few showers. Momase region, Lace City, cloudy with possible few showers. Meden, cloudy periods with brief showers. We were cloudy periods with some rain showers and possible thunderstorms. Vanimo, mostly cloudy with some showers and possible thunderstorms. NGI region, Lorengao, cloudy with possible few showers. Kavian, cloudy with possible showers. Kokopo and Rabaul partly cloudy with possible brief showers. Kimbe cloudy with some showers and drizzles. Buka cloudy with possible showers and drizzle. Highlands region Mount Hagen City cloudy periods with rain showers and possible thunderstorms. Goroka Bands and Kundiawa. Cloudy periods with some showers and possible thunderstorm. Mendi, Tari and Wabe, cloudy periods with some showers and possible thunderstorms. Small ships forecast waters of southern PNG to Indonesian border to Daru to Kiwai Islands to Kerema to Yule Island to Hood Point to Samurai Islands seas 1.0 to 2.0 meters. Waters of Samare Island to Cape Vogel and all Millen Bay Islands, seas 1.0 to 2.0 meters. Waters of Cape Vogel to Huon Gulf to Finshafen, seas 1.0 to 2.0 meters. Waters of Finshafen to Vitia Strait to CSC to Long Islands, Seas 2.0 to 3.0 meters. Waters of Long Island to Medang to Wewek to Vanimo and Northern PNG Indonesian border. Seas 1.0 to 2.0 meters. Waters of Manus and its western group of islands. Seas 2.0 to 3.0 meters. Waters of West New Britain to East New Britain to New Island. Seas 1.5 to 2.5 meters. Waters of Bougainville seas 1.0 to 2.0 meters. Looking at the ocean forecast, Coral Sea sees moderate becoming redder rough over eastern sector. West to northwest winds of 10 to 20, 15 to 20 knots. Solomon Sea sees moderate to rough. Northwesterly winds of 15 to 24 knots. Bismarck Sea sees rough to very rough. Northwesterly winds of 25 to 33 knots. The Pacific Ocean seas moderate. Northwesterly winds of 15 to 20 knots. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. 
And that wraps up the news, sports and weather for Wednesday, the 7th of February 2024. From all of us here, pleasant viewing. Bye for now. This news program was proudly brought to you by Smart Start Breakfast Biscuits and Gold Nuggets.